When you marinate in the presence of God, marination in the presence of God makes you tender. It makes you like Him. Jesus said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We talked the first night about hard-hearted people and how you can get hard-hearted really just from being in the world. I think just that whole Egypt thing gets off on you and by the time you've lived a few years, you take a little child on how innocent they are and tender-hearted and boy, you give them a few years in the world and it can be a totally different story. And as Christians, we have to really guard against letting our hearts get hard. Because if you have a hard heart, you cannot be moved with compassion. And so we need to pray for a tender heart and we need to work with the Holy Spirit to keep a tender heart. Ezekiel 11, 19. And I will give them one heart, a new heart. This is talking about when you receive Christ. And I will put a new spirit within them. And watch this. And I will take the stony, unnaturally hardened heart out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh sensitive and responsive to the touch of their God. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. How awesome it is to be able to feel the touch of God on your heart. One of the ways that we stay sensitive to God is by keeping our conscience clear to the best of our ability. When God convicts you of something, repent, be willing to turn away from it. Paul said in Acts 24, 16, that he really uh, would strive in the spirit to have a heart free of offense toward God and man. See, even, now, and you know, this just came back to me, but like, when those guys didn't have out here, you know, what I thought I should have out here. I didn't want them to sit over there and feel bad about that because I know they want to please me. And so God just touched my heart to just say, hey, it wasn't your fault. I'll take responsibility. And if I wouldn't have done that, it probably would have been harder for me to preach. It's so important if we don't do just the little things that God puts in our heart to make other people feel at ease. You know, there was no point in them feeling like, oh man, what do we do? Especially since one of the guys that's helping do this now is fairly new at it, and I certainly didn't want him to feel bad. We need to be sensitive to God. We need to be sensitive to how what we say is affecting people and how what we do is affecting people. And you know, I think we're all gonna hurt people's feelings at different times and not even know that we did it, and so we all need a lot of mercy and we need to give each other a lot of mercy. But when God shows us something, it's always better to go the extra mile and say, hey, if I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it to sound that way, or please forgive me. Keep your conscience void of offense toward God and man. Is that cool? All right. And a beautiful scripture, Matthew 11. I actually took this out of a book at one point and carried it in my wallet to refer to any time I was having an attack of hard-heartedness. Because I was a pretty tough lady. I mean, I'd been pushed around a lot, and I'd made myself a lot of promises. Nobody's ever going to hurt me again. Nobody's going to push me around again. I don't need anybody, yada, yada, yada. Anybody know where I'm at? All right. Well, the only problem with that is that's good for the world, but when you start trying to serve God and be sensitive to Him and sensitive to His touch and help other people, that doesn't work. And if you've still got that attitude, you're going to have to lose it. Amen? God didn't call you to take care of yourself. He wants to take care of you. He didn't call you to protect yourself. He wants to protect you. And you have to say, God, I am even willing to be hurt if that's what it takes to walk in love because I know that you're my healer and even if I get hurt, you'll heal me and make me better again. 
Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will ease, relieve, and refresh your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, humble, lowly in heart, and you will find rest. <laughs> Relief, ease, refreshment, and blessed recreation and quiet for your souls. For my yoke is wholesome, useful, good. Are you ready? It is not harsh, hard, sharp, or pressing. <laughs> but it is comfortable, gracious, and pleasant. And my burden is light and easy to be born. Let me ask you a question. Are you easy to be friends with? <laughs> Are you a low maintenance employee? You're not always stirring something up and making issues out of things. Are you quick to forgive and difficult to offend? Is it easy to be married to you? <laughs> Woo! I'll go talk to this side of the room. They're acting kind of funny over there. <laughs> we need to ask ourselves these questions. I can honestly say now that God has done a, an amazing work in me, and I'm growing every day, but I'm pretty easy to get along with now. But man, I tell you, there were years in my life where, you, I mean, if you were going to please me, you better work hard at it, and then it probably wouldn't work. Come on. So, you know, if you're hard to get along with, make a decision today. It's time for me to shape up. It's time for me to stop acting like the world revolves around me. Everybody is not alive on the planet to serve you. How many of you see this? You don't need to be harsh, hard, sharp, and pressing. Don't be legalistic. I mean, I used to couldn't even tell my kids to take the trash out without sounding like an army sergeant. Trash, get the trash out, 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 now, get it, move. I mean, I was bad. I'd tell my kids to go play, and then they'd get their toys out, and I'd tell them, clean that mess up, get that mess cleaned up, pick that up. <laughs> Don't be the kind of person that when you walk in the room, everybody just automatically tenses up. Come on, I, I know there's no people like that here. Maybe a few watching on TV that we could help, but no, nobody here like that, right? You're one of the easy going, easy to get along with, sweet people, never, you just, you're just cool, right? Amen. Now when we come to Him, which you must do this every day, <laughs> if there's any way at all possible, spend the first section of time in the morning, the most that you can manage to do with God. Get with him before you start talking to people. <laughs> I mean, that's like, I only talk to my dog before God, nobody else. <laughs> and then I don't say much to her, I just rub her head. I have to get with God so I can be nice. I have to get my nice genes stirred up. Amen? When I first started spending time with God in the morning, my kids would complain. This is back when they were teenagers. You have to go in that room every morning. Can't you come and make our breakfast? I said, you better be glad I'm in this room. <laughs> Trust me, your life is going to be a lot nicer if I go to this room. <laughs> and I think after a while they got it. Mom, go to your room. <laughs> when you marinate in the presence of God, Marination in the presence of God makes you tender. It makes you like Him. Jesus said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn how I do things because I am gentle, humble, meek, lowly. I am not harsh, hard, sharp, and pressing. Amen? It's such a blessing to see God give us that heart that's sensitive to His touch. Don't you think that just about the, most, the greatest miracle in the world is watching God change a human being? I think that is absolutely the most beautiful thing. Oh, wow, awesome. I want to talk to you now 
There's two more heart conditions we want to talk about before we're finished and I leave Columbus, Ohio. I want to talk to you about having a confident heart. Confidence is so important and it's not something you feel. It's something you make a decision about. First of all, you make a decision not to put your confidence in anything else. The Bible says put no confidence in the flesh, not your own flesh, not anybody else's flesh, not your bank account, not your education, but you put your confidence in Christ and Christ alone. Through him, all the dividing walls are broken down. I don't have to compare myself with anybody else. I don't have to try to be what anybody else is. I don't have to compete with them. I'm free to be me and I can have confidence to be me because my worth and value is based on who I am in him and not anything else. I, you can have a string of degrees as long as your arm. That don't make you any better than somebody that's got an eighth grade education. I graduated from the 12th grade, and here I am running a worldwide ministry. So let me tell you something. It's not about head knowledge. Now, I've gotten some degrees since then, but <laughs> I got them the good way. I got them given to me. <laughs> <laughs> I got like four or five of them, so it's like, yeah, praise the Lord. I've been given several degrees based on my books and the material in my books, and so I guess they can get in there and say, gosh, she knows something. But you know what? I didn't learn it from head knowledge. I got it from God. And I'm just here to tell you that God is the difference maker in your life. It doesn't matter what you can't do. It's what he can do that is a difference. And so if you have education and you have a lot of natural benefits and, you know, you have a lot of things in the natural going for you, then thank God for that, but don't depend on it. Because there's only one thing that's going to put you over in the kingdom of God, and that's God's presence and power, his anointing on your life. Amen? So we have to be confident. The Lord told me one time, he said, Joyce, it is so important when you're in that pulpit that you never lose your confidence because the minute you lose your confidence, you give the meeting to the devil. What did God, what did God tell Joshua? One thing. Only you must be strong and courageous and very bold and confident and do not fear. For even as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. He didn't tell him, go be like Moses. He said, the same way I was with Moses, I will be with you. It didn't really matter what Joshua could or couldn't do. God was with him. And that's why the Bible says we are not to fear. Fear not, for I am with you. Amen? You say, but I don't feel confident. So? Who says you have to feel confident? I said to be confident. Remember, we're not going to live by our feelings. I can choose to believe that I'm confident even if I don't feel confident. You think I always feel like I act? You just override your feelings and you get into the spirit. And then what you need is always there if you don't get in the flesh and start catering to it. Like I shared last night in our little time of exhortation, or yesterday morning, I forget when it was, it was such a great day for me when I learned that I could do things afraid. That to feel fear doesn't mean that you're a coward. Actually, boldness is taking action in the presence of fear. That's what it means to be bold. It means you feel fear and you say, I'm doing it anyway. I'm doing it anyway because I believe that's what God wants me to do. Amen? Confident. Don't go around comparing yourself to other people and wishing you looked like everybody else and thinking, oh, you can do that and I can't do this. You got a promotion at work and I didn't. You've got a higher position than me. Your voice is better than mine. You're the do, 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 do. Don't be comparing yourself with other people. And I'm telling you that we cannot even enjoy the gifts that God puts in other people if we don't stop comparing ourselves with them and thinking we need to be what they are. Come on, you're an individual before God. God's got a plan for you. You don't have to look like somebody else. Just go ahead today and make peace with your thighs. Just get it over with. Amen? 
Come on, how many of you got something about yourself, the way you look, you don't like, but you just can't seem to do anything about it? All right, well, make peace with it today. You know why? Who says it's wrong anyway? They? Who are they? They are running our life, and we don't even know who they are. They say, they say, they say, they say. Come on, you got to have confidence. You got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, God lives in me. I am a child of God. I am awesome through Christ. You better watch out, devil. You never know what I may do today. Psalm 27, 3. Keep your heart right. Have a confident heart. I'm confident in Christ. I know I make mistakes. I know I got things wrong with me. I know I got a long way to go. But you know what? I'm confident that God loves me. I'm confident about his forgiveness. And ha ha, devil, I am going to enjoy my day. <laughs> Thank you. Psalm 27. Oh, I love Psalm 27. This is like, Psalm 27, 4 is like one of my very favorite verses in the whole Bible. And I'll read it to you in just a minute. But the verse before it, verse 3 says, Even though a host encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, even then in this will I be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek, inquire for, and insistently require, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord in His presence all the days of my life, to behold and gaze upon His beauty, His sweet attractiveness, delightful loveliness, and to meditate, consider, and inquire in His temple. For in the day of trouble He will hide me in His shelter, in the secret place of His tent, will he hide me? He will set me high upon a rock, and now shall my head be lifted up. When shall my head be lifted up? Next week, next year, when my problem's over. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Why? Because of verse 4. You marinate in the presence of God. One thing have I desired, and that will I seek after. Seek, 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 crave, pursue, and go after with all my might, that I might dwell in his presence and behold his beauty all the days of my life. I can do without a lot of things, but I cannot do without the presence of God. I have to have the presence of God, because when I don't, everything else goes haywire. I have a slogan I live by. I'll do my best, God. You do the rest. Because I know my best is never going to be enough. So we've always got to trust God to do the part that we cannot do. Everybody say, I will, be I will be confident. So there's all kinds of great scriptures about confidence in the Bible. And the last thing that I want to talk to you about today is keeping and maintaining a forgiving, merciful heart. My goodness. I have to tell you today that I think this is probably one of the most important areas for the believer. And I'll tell you why I think it's so important, not just because the Bible has a lot to say about it, but I think because the devil works so hard trying to keep us all upset, angry, bitter, resentful, in strife, offended. I mean, if you can make it through one day and not get offended, it's a blessing. I mean, it is astounding to me the number of angry Christians that there are. And it's like an oxymoron. The two don't go together. It's like that's not, that's not the way that we're supposed to be. And it's all tied up in that realm of feelings. But I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. Well, don't worry about how you feel. Just start doing what God tells you to do. The minute that somebody hurts you, you need to pray for them, just like the Bible says. Immediately. You pray for people. The second thing you need to do is stop talking about them. Amen. Man, the saints are getting nervous in their seats. Some of you got up and shifted sides. You know why you have to stop talking about it? Because 
It's like picking a scab off of a wound. Now, if you need to talk about it for some reason, that's one thing, but you just won't believe what so-and-so did to me. Well, you just won't believe what so-and-so did to me. Well, you just won't believe. Well, you won't believe. Well, you won't believe. And oh, it's so hard if somebody has hurt you and somebody who doesn't know what they did to you begins to say something nice about them. Let's say John has really hurt you and now somebody comes along and says, oh man, that John, he is a great guy. <laughs> it's just like next to impossible to not say, oh, well, uh -huh. there's a few things you don't know. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Yeah. So you're going to pray for him. You're going to stop talking about him. And when it's appropriate, you're actually going to go the extra mile to bless them. <laughs> <laughs> Romans 12. These next few verses I'm about to read you, I believe, are a key, a real key, and I'm serious about this. I think that they're a real key to having that life flow that God wants to be flowing through you to other people. Verse 16 through 21, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, snobbish, high-minded, exclusive, but readily adjust yourself. <laughs> Uh-oh. I'd rather everybody adjust to me, wouldn't you? <laughs> but readily adjust yourself to people, things, and give yourself to humble tasks Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceits. Repay no one evil for evil. But take thought for what is honest and proper and noble, aiming to be above reproach in the sight of God and everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you. We gotta quit worrying about what everybody else does and do our part. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I love to see people who refuse to let other people have a problem with them. <laughs> they just keep loving, keep loving, keep loving, keep loving, keep loving until they break them down. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy's hungry, feed him. <laughs> If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals upon his head. And that's not what you think it is. I used to think, yeah. <laughs> but in Proverbs, it says that those burning coals are actually love poured out on them that will melt a hard heart. You get it? So see, when somebody is not treating you right, they're being disrespectful, they're being mean, they're not being thoughtful. If you pray for them, and then when they have a need, you meet their need, the love, the red hot fiery love that you pour out on them melts their hard heart. And the last verse, this is my life verse. I'm living by this thing. Do not let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome and master evil with good. I live by that. That's my life verse. I learned that in the situation with my father, and I apply that over and over and over. We have something tragic happen. I know the enemy just wants to use it to distract me and stop me. And I just say, you know what? I was reaching two thirds of the world with the gospel. Now I've just decided that I'm just gonna go for the other third. That's it, devil, you've made me mad. Well, I believe if you're watching the program today that you're someone who really wants to grow in your relationship with God. And so if you do want to have a heart that's like the heart of God, and you're willing to let God go ahead and deal with you in areas that need to change in your life, that's a very good thing. Remember that you must have a willing heart. 
God is a gentleman and he's not going to force things on you. So as you begin to pray and ask God to change you, you're going to begin to feel conviction about things in your life that God thinks are wrong. And you need to celebrate that. Don't ever feel condemned when you feel convicted. Conviction is from God and it's to lift you out of the problem. Condemnation is from the devil and it's to press you down and make you miserable. We've been talking today about how to unclog the arteries of your heart by letting God deal with us about these things that are offensive to Him and are keeping us from His presence. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and you know taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, as we travel around the world, we meet so many wonderful children that have had such desperate need in their life. And we're so grateful to be able to help them. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded. And he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident. And when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now. And so thank you for helping us provide homes for some dead and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. The freedom from bad habits lies in filling your life with one good habit after another. First we farm habits and eventually they farm us. The Bible says that we overcome evil with good. And with God's help, I believe that you can put an end to the struggle and discover a new level of success in your life. Op deze dubbel DVD legt Joyce uit welke goede gewoonten belangrijk zijn en hoe dit je leven zal verbeteren. Goede gewoonten aanleren, slechte gewoonten doorbreken is ook als boek verkrijgbaar. Bestel ze samen en ontvang korting via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en ontvang elke dag inspirerende uitspraken van Joyce op jouw Facebook. Open, direct en to the point. Kleine oases in je dagelijks leven. Lees mee, het is het waard. Alleen bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook.